Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, invited lecture session for this afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure for the first lecture to introduce uh, Alan Sly from Princeton. So the title is a Fast Transition of, of a Random Constraint Satisfactions Problem. Um, thank you so much, it's a, it's a great honor to, uh, uh, to speak here. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, random constraint satisfaction problems. Yeah, um, okay. Okay, um, and so, uh, um, okay. Okay, good. Uh, so, uh, um, constraint satisfaction problem is, a, is like a term from uh, theoretical computer science, and it just means what it sounds like. You have a, a collection of variables and you want them to satisfy some set of constraints. So imagine solving a system of equations, uh, coloring a graph, uh, or satisfying a Boolean formula. And they, they play a sort of important role in complexity theory. Um, but since this is a, a probability talk, um, I'll, be, I'll be interested in the, uh, the random uh, case of them, where the constraints are chosen randomly, maybe uniformly at random from some, some set, or, or according to some other random rule. Okay, so, so to fix some uh, examples or ideas in mind, we could think about uh, certain uh, combinatorial questions of random graphs. So uh, you take uh, the erdos renyi random graph, you have n vertices and connect each pair of edges with probability alpha over n, so the, the fixing the the typical or the average degree to be alpha or, or also a random regular graph. And, uh, and I'll be thinking about sparse random graphs where the average degree is a constant. And you could ask, is there a, is there a K coloring of the graph? Uh, so here the, the variables are just the, the colors of the vertices and the, the constraints are the, are the edges saying that uh, neighboring vertices have to have different colors. And since the edges are chosen randomly, it's a, it's a random CSP. Um, another um, uh, another example would be looking at uh, large independent sets of, uh, of the random graph, so more of a, an optimization flavor of, of, the, of the problem. And um, uh, so an independent set would be a subset of the vertices such that uh, you have no edges between uh, vertices in the set. So in a coloring, the, say the red vertices uh, must form an independent set. Okay. Maybe the canonical example of a, of a random CSP is uh, the, the random KSAT model. So this is a model of a random Boolean formula. You have, uh, so n Boolean vo um, variables, uh, each one true or false, and for the rest of the talk, I'll just say plus or minus. Um, and uh, m clauses or, or constraints, which will um, be constructed just by taking the um, k of the variables or their negations, chosen uniformly at random, and you take the or of those. Um, and so a, a random three set formula might look something like this. Um, yeah, I can't really turn around to <laughs> um, look at it, but um, so the clause, okay. The, the clauses are, are something like X3 or X4 or not X5. Um, so for, for three sat, and we want all of them to be satisfied, so we take the, the and of them, okay. And uh, obviously, the more constraints you have, the harder it will be to satisfy all of them simultaneously. Um, and so we can parameterize it by the clause or constraint density, um, the ratio of the number of constraints divided by the number of variables, which is, is the right scaling to take. And I'll call this alpha from now on. Okay. And uh, also, at times, mention a variant of the random case that problem, uh, the not all equals that model which just asks that um, s solutions to the formula um, or X satisfies the formula and also the negation of X satisfies it. And somehow this extra symmetry uh, uh, makes it a bit uh, easier to, or tractable in some cases. Okay, so, so just to say, we'll be interested in the assignments of the variables uh, that satisfy the formula that make it evaluate to true. Um, and uh, yeah, so which we'll call satisfying assignments. Okay, um, and, and all of the constraint satisfaction problems I'll talk about will have sort of a, a graphical representation. The, 
the combinatorial properties of random graphs, it's, it's obvious what the graph is there. But for, um, for random case at, we can also construct a, a graph as follows. So if we, if we take a, a formula, we can construct a bipartite uh, graph, sometimes called a, a factor graph, where uh, on one side of the graph, for, uh, you have a vertex for each of the variables. On the other side of the graph, you have a vertex for each of the clauses, and you just add an edge between a variable and a clause if that variable appears in the clause. Um, now, since the clauses were chosen uh, at random, this is a random graph, and, uh, uh, and like most, uh, or, or at least many models of random graphs, it's locally tree-like, so you don't expect to see many short cycles. If you, if you pick a random vertex and look at its local neighborhood, what you'll see is a tree. But at least if you have a, a reasonable density of constraints, it's, uh, it, won't, it won't be a, you know, a tree. It will have uh, sort of lots of much longer cycles. But still, the fact that it's locally tree-like is really what makes the model uh, tractable and what, what makes it possible to make uh, sort of really exact predictions for, uh, for these models. Um, OK. And so, uh, yeah, so what, what, what are the, the questions we're interested in? Well, the, the first question is just, when do you have solutions? And so what is the um, density of constraints you can have such that you still have, uh, that, such that there are any solutions to the random CSP? And then once you know that, you can ask some more detailed questions as well, like uh, how many solutions are there? Um, what does a, a typical one look like if you just choose a uniformly random solution of the CSP? And, uh, or, or a more algorithmic question, can you uh, uh, efficiently find, uh, find a solution? Um, that one we probably know the least about. Okay. So, um, so on the, the first question, um, one of the, the main conjectures is, uh, is just that uh, there does exist some uh, critical density of constraints uh, that determines whether or not there are solutions sort of asymptotically when you have a, a large number of variables. And, uh, and I'm stating it for the uh, random case app model, but it, the, same, the same conjecture applies to random colorings of random graphs or, or any of the, the other CSPs. Um, and so just to, just to say uh, th what this uh, means, we, we could look at the probability of it being satisfiable as a function of the um, uh, constraint density. And of course, this should be a decreasing function. Um, and as n grows, it should, um, it should become more and more steep and become more closer and closer to a step function um, at some. And what's expected is that there's some critical density alpha sat. So the probability of being satisfiable tends to 1 when alpha is less than alpha sat, tends to 0 when alpha is uh, greater than alpha sat. Um, and, and so this is the conjecture, and it's conjectured to hold for all k greater than or equal to 2. Um, there's a, a result of Frigut which comes tantalizingly close to, to proving this, um, and it, just using essentially the abstract theory of, of Boolean functions and their sharp thresholds. And, and what he shows is that um, th this function becomes more and more like a step function. The, the window between going down from 1 minus epsilon uh, probability to epsilon uh, shrinks to 0 as n tends to infinity. All that's missing in uh, Frigut's result um, is, is really about the location of where the transition happens. It, it's some, the, the machinery is somehow too abstract to, to nail that down and say that um, the location of this threshold is, uh, is really doesn't depend on n. In principle, it could be that it fluctuates for different or is different for, say, even n or odd n. No one would expect, would believe that, but uh, that's, that's the sort of missing uh, piece there. Okay. Um, and so the, I mean, most of what I want to tell you uh, today is uh, uh, really a, about predictions coming from uh, uh, statistical mechanics and the study of disordered systems for, for, um, for understanding random case at, random, random colorings of random graphs, uh, and, a, and a university universality class of, of other models, and, uh, and the different phase transitions they, they undergo. And then about the, the, what progress we've made in uh, um, 
trying to establish some of these uh, predictions. Um, and I mean, I say, I say predictions as uh, you know, Greg Lawler uh, said, for, for the physicists, this is, is really theory, and, and we owe a sort of um, great debt to them for the, the sort of depth of insight they, they give us in these problems, even if they're not working in the, the framework of, of mathematical proofs. Um, okay, and I want to um, talk about a, a couple of ideas um, that sort of lead to the, the heuristics uh, they have for you know, making these predictions. One is, is replica symmetry breaking, which um, you can think of as perhaps as a way of understanding the way the space of solutions splits into clusters of solutions. And another will be the cavity method, which is, is roughly speaking a, a way of sort of saying, okay, we'll add one extra variable to the, the formula and see what happens and do calculations uh, based on that after making certain assumptions. Okay, so if you think about these problems, the first thing you might do is just calculate the expected number of uh, solutions. And that's, so, so Z will be the, the number of satisfying assignments. And it's, uh, it's, a very, it's an easy calculation to work out the expected value. It's, uh, it will be exponential in N with some exponent that's a decreasing function of alpha. And so you could look at the point at which this exponent is zero and uh, so that marks the point where it goes from expected number of solutions increasing exponentially to decreasing exponentially. And so of course that must give a, an upper bound on the um, satisfiability threshold, assuming it exists. Um, but it's not, the right, it's not the right upper bound. It's an overestimate. And, uh, and it's, uh, you can easily see why. Because, okay, in, in these formulas, um, if you look at a particular variable, asymptotically, the number of clauses it's in will be distributed as a Poisson variable. So there's some probability that it will be in none of the clauses at all. And there'll be epsilon n variables which are just completely unconstrained, not in any of the clauses at all. So these epsilon n could be set to um, whatever you like without affecting the, um, whether or not the, the formula evaluates to true. So if you have one solution, it means that you have at least two to the epsilon n solutions. So if you plug that into Markov's inequality, uh, that would give you a slightly better bound uh, on the sort of upper bound on the satisfiability threshold. Um, that's still not the right bound, but it, but it I think, emphasizes the point that um, you have to come to grips with the fact that Solutions come in clusters of solutions. When there's one solution, there's a lot of ones nearby, and somehow a lot of the theory is um, related, to, uh, related to that fact. So the first moment is good for, for upper bounds, and the second moment can be good for lower bounds on the number of solutions. So the ratio of the um, uh, first moment squared over the second moment is a lower bound on the probability of it being satisfiable. But it's only a useful lower bound if, if those two are of the same order. And uh, unfortunately for random case that, this fails for all values of alpha greater than zero. Um, it works better for random colorings and some other models. Um, this was a work of uh, Akliopdis and Nawar show uh, proved uh, sort of um, not sharp, but very good bounds on uh, uh, colorings, just uh, essentially applying the the second moment method. Um, all of the work really does, uh, on, in terms of lower bounds, really does use the second moment method, but just, but it has to be applied to different random variables. And either uh, solutions uh, with weights or solutions, uh, or, or some sort of cleverly chosen subset of solutions. Okay. And so just to, just to say why the, the second moment doesn't, doesn't work, there's really two sort of reasons, both of which are like, like they're separate but they're, um, and, and both need to be dealt with. The first is the, the issue of, of clustering that I mentioned. And this, this only becomes a problem for um, constraint densities that are close to the satisfiability threshold. And this is a problem in all of these models. 
Um, and, and what happens is that there are atypically big clusters that are exponentially rare, but still make a dominant contribution to the expected value. Um, but random case that has another issue as well, which is uh, what we call neighborhood profile fluctuations. And, and what I mean by that is sort of the distribution of how many different local neighborhoods you have. The simplest example of this would just be looking at the, the degree distribution of the, of the graph. So, um, and uh, as we said, we expect that to be a, a Poisson distribution. Um, the event that you have a, uh, the empirical distribution of the degrees is significantly away from Poisson will be in uh, a large deviation event, so exponentially unlikely. But none, nonetheless, there are some of these large deviation events um, correspond to uh, graphs or, or formulas with so many solutions um, that even though they're exponentially rare, they still make the dominant contribution to the expected value. So you need to, um, um, so, so sort of taming the, the sort of graphs that have the wrong neighborhood structure. And so, so you know, you could say, okay, well, maybe I'll condition on the, the degree sequence, but then you could look at neighborhoods of depth two or three, which would be trees of depth two or three. They could have the wrong distribution. And somehow you have to control for this uh, at all depths. Um, this is maybe the, the most technical part of, uh, of the work, um, at least that, that we did in this, and uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not really going to be able to get into the details of it, but uh, I just wanted to, to mention that. Okay, so, so the next thing I want to do is, is talk about the, um, the physics predictions. Um, it the story really starts with the um, spin glass models, which are, um, I think, originally were sort of models for the magnetic properties of, of alloys of metals, um, but, and, but these are sort of you know, really toy models for that, and the, the one that's maybe received the most attention is the, the famous Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. So it's a, it's a probability distribution where each variable is either a, a plus one or minus one, and it's with a Hamiltonian that's a sum of xi, xj, times uh, GIJ, where the GIJ is a IID Gaussian random variables. Um, and uh, so, so it's really a, a dense model where every variable interacts with every other one sort of directly. Um, and, uh, and starting with work of um, Parisi in, the, uh, in 79, uh, he made a, a series of predictions using you know, almost unbelievable uh, methods and heuristics. Um, but nonetheless, uh, in the last, um, you know, 15 or so years, many of those uh, striking predictions have been, have been established. Work of uh, Guerra, uh, Talegrand's proof of the um, Parisi formula for the free energy of the, um, and uh, uh, Panchenko's proof of, uh, more recently, of ultramatricity. Um, so these are really dense models. There's, there's interactions between all pairs of variables, unlike the, the random CSPs we're, we're talking about uh, that, are, that are really sparse. But, but even as early as the, the mid 80s, uh, Mizard and Parisi sort of suggested that the, the same sorts of methods uh, um, should, be, should be applicable. And um, um, Mizard and Parisi and Zakina made, uh, made a you know, a lot of progress on this and, and sort of uh, the sort of very uh, detailed description that I'm going to give now is uh, sort of in work of uh, Krizakala, Montanari, uh, Richie Tensingi, Samajan, and Zeb, Zeb Bradova. Um, okay. okay, and it's, it's really a description of the, the way the, the space of solutions uh, splits into clusters. Um, and so what um, we can think of two solutions as being adjacent if they just differ at a single variable. And so if you have a notion of adjacency, you can talk about the, the connected components of solutions. Um, and, and those will be the clusters. Uh, so the predictions are that when the density of constraints is small, um, there's, one, there's a giant component that has all or almost all of the solutions. But the, um, above a certain threshold, the clustering or shattering threshold, 
the space of solutions breaks into exponentially many uh, clusters, each with an exponentially small fraction, all well separated from each other. This, this seems to be the point at which all of the algorithms that we know for finding solutions seem to stop working, although there's, that's more, more just an observation. Um, although um, having a very clustered space of, of solutions you know, at least says that uh, local algorithms are going to have trouble. Um, okay, and, and the existence of such a phase was shown by uh, Akliopdis and Kodjo Glan. Um, a second phase transition occurs is called the condensation threshold. There's still exponentially many clusters, but now the biggest few clusters um, dominate and, and have, a, have most of the solutions. Um, so it's sort of a uh, world of inequality, and, uh, and, uh, and a more fine prediction is that the, the relative cluster sizes obey a, a Poisson Dirichlet distribution. And then the final threshold is, is the satisfiability threshold after which you have no more solutions. Okay, so this was a, like, quite a qualitative description of, of the different phases, but um, they come with uh, precise quantitative predictions as well. And, uh, and, and so, in particular, there are, there are formulas for, for each of these transitions, and I'll tell you about the condensation and satisfiability thresholds. Okay, and, and I'm gonna do it in the context of uh, regular, you know, models on regular graphs, so think um, uh, colorings of, of random regular graphs, uh, just because it's, um, it's a bit simpler to state in, in this setting, but, but, but a similar description of, um, sort of is there for uh, random case out of, and, and other models as well. Um, okay, and okay, the idea is that imagine that we look at uh, clusters sort of sorted according to their different sizes. Um, so we'll suppose that the number of clusters of size approximately e to the n times s is given, is, is e to the n times sigma of s, so there's some, so just make the assumption that some, that that exponent sigma of s exists. Then if we wanted to calculate the expected number of solutions, we could just sum over different cluster sizes, and uh, the cluster size that has the biggest contribution would be, you just get by maximizing s plus sigma of s, because this is on a, an exponential scale, and, uh, and that corresponds to the point at which uh, the derivative of sigma is minus one. Okay, and so this is, this is what the picture is supposed to look like in the clustered regime. Um, as you increase the density of uh, constraints, there's, there'll be fewer solutions and uh, fewer clusters of solutions, so sigma will decrease. Um, the condensation threshold um, will be at the, the point at which uh, the tangent point lies on the x-axis. Um, in the condensation regime, it lies below the x-axis, then the satisfiability threshold is the last time you have any solutions or any clusters of solutions, so it's the point at which the maximum of sigma is at zero, and then the satisfiability threshold, uh, sigma is uh, always negative. Okay. Um, let me just highlight what's happening in the, the condensation regime, because it, it sort of tells you why uh, the second moment method won't work, because uh, because the typical number of solutions will be much smaller than the expected number. And this is because the biggest contribution to the expected value comes from um, cluster sizes, which are exponentially rare, because, because sigma is negative. Um, so you don't expect to see those at all. So what should you predict for the, the, um, the typical number of solutions? Uh, well, well one, one guess is that um, uh, you should look at the largest cluster size that you actually expect to appear. So the largest root of, uh, of sigma. Um, and of course at this point sigma is zero, so the number that you expect to see is e to the n times zero, and this is why it's, it's predicted that uh, you just see order one clusters that, that dominate, uh, the, the, that have most of the solutions. Um, if you interpret sigma as not just sort of some expected value, but actually encoding a, a Poisson density, that would lead you to the prediction that the relative sizes um, look like a Poisson Dirichlet distribution. 
OK, so, so just to, to summarize the different predictions, if you knew sigma, um, then you'd have a formula for the satisfiability threshold, the condensation threshold, and also within the condensation threshold, um, the, the free energy or sort of the, the normalized log number of solutions. Okay. And, and so these I'll call the, the, the one replica symmetry breaking uh, predictions. Um, okay, and uh, I've said replica symmetry breaking a couple of times without really saying what that means. So replica really just, re replica just means samples from the distribution. Um, replica symmetry breaking is, I, I mean, uh, in the context of uh, spin glasses, and, but you can also think about it in the context of CSPs. Um, you can think of this saying, you take, say, two samples from the, um, of solutions, look at their Hamming distance. Um, if it's uh, replica symmetric, um, you would say that the, the Hamming distance would be concentrated. If, you're rep if it's replica symmetry breaking, it would, be uh, it would you know, not be concentrated. And one, one RSB corresponds to it being concentrated on two different points. And this is what we expect in the condensation regime. And roughly what the two points mean is that you sample two solutions and either you sample them both from the same cluster or you sample them from different clusters. And the, the Hamming distance will be small if they're in the same cluster and big if, if they're in different clusters. Okay. But another interpretation of what, what this sort of one-step replica symmetry breaking means is that um, there's clustering of solutions but there's no, not really further structure beyond that. You don't get clusters of clusters or clusters of clusters of clusters, uh, as you do in other models like the, the Sharrington Kirkpatrick model. Um, and so what that suggests is maybe that we would be better off working with the clusters themselves because they don't have any extra structure and just look, looking at moments uh, counting uh, the number of clusters that you see. And, uh, and this has turned out to be a really uh, fruitful uh, approach, particularly in um, models on, on regular graphs, um, where you don't have to deal with the, the difficulties of uh, uh, neighborhood fluctuations, because all the neighborhoods look the same. OK. And so, so just to mention um, the, the cases where we, we now know the predictions for these models, um, random uh, uh, colorings of random graphs, and, and for the uh, regular not -a equal sat model, um, the, the condensation threshold is now known, uh, or I mean rigorously established. Um, maybe the, the, hardest, the hardest one to do, I think, is the, the free energy in the condensation regime, uh, and this is, is known for the, the regular not -a equal sat model, and uh, satisfiability thresholds are now known in several models in not all equal SAT and, and regular SAT, um, also looking at the, the maximum independent set of a, of a random regular graph, and, uh, and uh, now also in the, the non-regular sort of model of just general uh, random case SAT. Um, now, you might note that all of these come with a sort of uh, qualification of large K or large D, um, and for the most part, that's sort of a, you know, a technical failing of, uh, um, of you know, us and people working in the field. Be, um, things just are easier to, many quantities are, when, when K is big, or when the, uh, then the degrees of the graph are, are bigger, um, and, and they become much more concentrated. And that, that somehow, uh, and various quantities are much more concentrated, and that just makes uh, the models easier to deal with. Um, but it's expected for, for instance, for the results of random case at that the, um, the prediction should hold uh, for all values of K. Um, that's not true in all of these cases. In the case of uh, looking at the, the maximum size of an independent set on a random regular graph, um, uh, it's, so we know, we know the asymptotics of that for large D. Um, but it's the one RSB formula is only supposed to hold down to, to D equals 20. For D less than or equal to 19, 
there's supposed to be a, a different regime, um, a full replica symmetry breaking where you, you know, now there, there will be clusters of clusters of clusters and so on, um, and, uh, and, a, and a different formula. Um, okay. Uh, okay, but so I said that um, the sort of uh, approaches follow looking at count, uh, looking at moments of uh, the number of clusters. But how would you do that? Um, after all, the, the definition I gave you of clusters in terms of you know connected components doesn't sound like a very tractable um, uh, description to use. Um, but that. It turns out there's uh, very nice combinatorial descriptions for, for what a cluster looks like. And so we could imagine, um, okay, just we start from some satisfying assignment and we want to build a description of the cluster that it lives in. Okay, so, so initially all the variables are labeled uh, plus or minus. Um, some of the variables um, we could flip uh, between plus and minus without uh, violating any of the constraints. So we're going to label those uh, with an F for free. Um, okay, so, so label as many variables as free as possible. And it may be that labeling some variables as free means we can um, make some other variables free. So we keep iterating this until uh, uh, we can't label any more, more variables free. And so we get a configuration where every variable is labeled either plus, minus, or free. Okay, and it turns out that um, these labelings of plus minus frees are essentially in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, the clusters of solutions. So this, this gives a, um, a sort of concise combinatorial way of, of encoding the clusters. Um, and and these, um, when these plus minus free configurations satisfy uh, sort of just some simple rules, which are as follows, um, the free variables have, uh, can't be forced by any of the clauses that they're in. So you have to be able to set them to either, both plus and minus without them violating any of the uh, clauses that they're in. Um, on the other hand, the, the plus variables, and similarly the minus variables, have to be forced by at least one clause. If you were to flip them, then, uh, then there'd be a clause that was violated because otherwise we, we should have labeled it as free. And finally, also, none of the, the clauses can be violated. Um, and so this, is, this plus minus free model gives a, um, is a good model for, or, or, you know, is essentially in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, um, the clusters of the original model. Okay. Um, and so what, you know, what makes this more complicated model better? Well, it has a it has a much more it has a rigidity property. You can't I can't just take a variable and change its labels without breaking uh, one of these rules. So you you always need to change more. So so there's no adjacent solutions in this plus minus free model. And in fact, typically you have to change a constant fraction of the the labels to get another one that satisfies all the rules. Uh, and in particular, what that means is there's no clustering in this uh, plus minus three model. So this is the one we want to work with and calculate moments of solutions of and so on. Okay, so, um, so I also want to mention the, the cavity method, uh, another heuristic from, from physics, which is, is sort of essential in, in the, the predictions they make. And this is really understanding what happens when you go from a, a formula with n variables to one with n plus one. So, um, okay, so you imagine we, we add in an, an extra variable. And, uh, okay, we want to um, and then do some calculations. So before we add it in, imagine we know the joint distribution of all of uh, the green ones that it's going to be connected to. Uh, so, we, so we know their joint distribution. Then when we, we add this one in, we could calculate lots of things. We could calculate the marginal distribution um, at the new vertex. And I mean, the, when, I say, when I say distribution, I mean the distribution of what a, a random uh, uh, assignment or, or solution looks like. Um, 
so that we can calculate the marginal at the new vertex, and we can also work out the change in the number of solutions as we go from n plus 1 or n variables to n plus 1, the, the multiplicative change at least. Um, OK, so this would be great if we actually knew what the, the joint distribution of the neighbors was. So, so the replica sy symmetric heuristic, which is, is what's expected to apply below the condensation threshold, uh, is, that, is that these should be, um, uh, they should be independent. So it should look like a product measure. And uh, essentially because they're all far away from each other, because uh, they were picked at random. Um, and the marginals should be drawn from some measure mu. Okay. This is, no, but this is, um, you know, not ex or, you know, expected to be false once you enter the condensation regime where it's one RSB. Um, but if we look at the, the plus minus free model, this will be replica, still be replica symmetric. So, um, so, so we should just restrict our attention to this, uh, this new plus minus free model and, the, and we'll, we'll still be dealing with a, a product measure. Um, so we could w calculate everything as long as we knew uh, this law mu of what the marginals should be. So how do you, how do you get a hold of that? Well, um, the f there's also, um, you can also make an assumption that it should be, uh, um, you know, there shouldn't be a dramatic change when you go from n variables to n plus one variables. So the, the marginal distribution should be essentially the same in that case. So, um, so, the, so the marginal of uh, the new vertex V should also be distributed according to mu, but we could work out what the marginal distribution at V is in terms of the marginals of its neighbors. So essentially this means that mu is going to have to satisfy a fixed point equation. Um, and once we know, so, so you can determine mu based on that, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, the, time, uh, the time here has stopped for some reason on my clock, so you should, okay, yeah. I'm sort of stopped at 12 minutes and 58 seconds. I thought I was, Thanks, Greg. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So this is for the random case that this is the this is the fixed point equation that it needs to to satisfy, um, and so so you find a fixed point of that. You then you say, okay, well, how is the um, partition function going to change when you add in a new variable uh, or the or the log of that? So and you you arrive at this formula. So it's uh, the expected change in log of the number of clusters. And so this, uh, so phi uh, should be the, the exponential growth rate of the number of clusters. And then just the prediction for the, the satisfiability threshold is just when this is zero. The point where you go from having a, uh, the number of solutions growing exponentially to shrinking exponentially. So this is, this is the, the prediction. Um, Okay, um, so just in terms of what's been known previously, uh, the case of k equals two is simpler. There's a sort of branching process argument and the threshold is one. So the, the previous slide was just for k greater than or equal to three. Um, the first moment gives a, a very, uh, uh, you know, gives actually quite a good upper bound and there's a slightly more complicated argument that gives a very good upper bound. The earlier lower bounds were sort of algorithmic, but they're, they're really stuck below the clustering threshold. And all of the progress after that has been non-constructive, um, using essentially more and more sophisticated versions of the second moment method. Um, and, and the final result now is that there are, there are matching <coughs> upper and lower bounds, so for, for large enough values of k. So, uh, so for all large enough values of k, the satisfiability conjecture uh, holds, uh, and, and moreover, it's at, a th at the threshold um, predicted by um, the physicist in, in this version, uh, by, uh, first by Mertens, Mazard, and Zakina. Um, and so, 
the proof uses um, uh, the second moment method, and it's really guided by the, the, the heuristics of, uh, um, that, that I just talked about, in, in particular in, uh, in terms of um, the marginal probabilities of, of variables are really determined by their local neighborhood, and, and uh, that's done in a way uh, predicted by the, the, the cavity method. Um, okay, so uh, let me just finish with uh, um, by, by saying that there's really a lot more to do in this area. Um, so the same story ought to apply to, uh, um, to, to colorings of random graphs. It should be possible to exactly pinpoint, you know, which average degree, for which uh, average degrees you, the graphs are, are k-colorable. Um, what would be even better would be to have methods that didn't involve sort of going through a lot of the same sort of calculations for every individual model. Um, oh. um, and, and, and also, also there are many aspects of, uh, uh, of this phase diagram that, uh, that we don't yet understand. Some of them we don't understand in any of the models yet. So maybe to highlight one um, would be uh, just to look at the, um, the condensation regime. Uh, here we expect that the biggest few clusters have most of the solutions. Uh, we don't know that yet in, in any example, and, and in, um, let, alone the fact that let alone that they obey a Poisson-Dirichlet distribution. Um, also, models at finite temperature. So there are some very natural questions along the lines of that. So, for instance, you have a random graph. How many independent sets are there of different sizes? And for that, you need to sort of uh, work at um, finite temperatures. And, um, and for that, the clusters no longer have such a simple uh, description. The, the, you don't have the same rigidity of clusters that you did anymore. Um, and, and maybe a, a, a sort of final frontier is um, models with uh, full replica symmetry breaking. So the, maybe the simplest example of this would be the, the max cut problem, or equivalently the, the ground state of the anti-ferromagnetic easing model. So essentially you, want to, you have your random graph and you want to divide the, the vertices into two sets to have the most possible edges uh, uh, going between them. And this, um, uh, this is supposed to be a full replica symmetry breaking. And, uh, and, the, and there's been some, some recent progress on this, but still, uh, I think even at the, the level of physics, there's not um, sort of exact predictions of where the you know, asymptotics of the um, size of the, the bigger, the, of the max cut is. Um, okay, well, thanks for, thanks for listening. Thank you, Alan. Are there any questions? Thank you. So you define these clusters in terms of adjacency defined by Hamming distance 1. Do the thresholds move if it's Hamming distance at most 10? Um, right. So. Um, uh, okay, so for a typical cluster, at least, it's usually a, a, a linear distance away from the, the nearest other clusters. Yeah, so um, there'll be there'll be rare clusters that are close to each other, but but typically uh, typically they're a long way away from each other. Hi. Um, is there any hope of extending to problems where there's a mild global constraint like Hamilton cycles in graphs, counting those? Um, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I mean, in terms of 
So Hamilton cycles, the, the more, um, you know, I mean, the, the closest natural model to that would be one where you just want to select, ed I guess, is it cycle, cover like covering it with cycles. Um, for that, um, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, you can, you can certainly make predictions um, uh, for, say, when, uh, when you can cover a graph with cycles. Um, so so one, one problem in this direction uh, that, um, you know, you might hope to do is uh, um, Hamilton cycles for graphs where half of the d vertices are degree three and half are degree four. Um, and so I've thought about that a bit uh, and there are, somehow the constraints for that are a bit more rigid and uh, um, that seemed, uh, that seemed more difficult uh, for reasons I probably can't say in the next 30 seconds. So, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, those are very interesting, uh, interesting directions. Other questions? If not, uh, I think that we can thanks again, uh, Alan.